In remembrance of the anniversary of the evacuation of Dunkirk in 1940, I'm going to try and give you an insight into the men and boats that left Deal to help in the rescue of our tro troops in those fateful few days. The story of Dunkirk has been well told and of our army's rescue from the French town and its beaches as the German army closed the net around their only way of escape at the beginning of the Second World War. And as you know, it's a story of great planning, luck and heroes all in equal measure. In those days, there were mainly two forms of information. Firstly, there was the radio, which was subject to heavy censorship, and secondly, good old gossip, which wasn't. The people of Deal would have been aware something was going on, but wouldn't have been sure of what it was or how dire the situation was on the other side of the channel. By the middle of May, they would have known that the phony war was over and things were now getting serious as Holland and Belgium had both been invaded and overrun by the German army. Ships were being attacked out at sea and anti-aircraft guns were beginning to appear around the town. Air raid shelters were also hastily being erected and our local defence volunteers made their first appearance. Troops arrived in Deal and started to construct anti-invasion defences along our seafront, consisting mainly of scaffolding and anti-tank obstacles and parts of this scaffolding can still be found today along the beach at low tide. The first call for help to the Deal boatman came at Fred Hook's wedding, which was being held at the boatsman rooms at the top of Exchange Street. In the middle of celebrations, the doors of the hall suddenly opened and standing there was the local policeman along with a naval officer and the chief of the local Coast Guard. The naval officer asked all the boats to be on the beach to be made available and were there any volunteers willing to help? As far as I can ascertain, eight boats left Deal Beach to help at Dunkirk. They were the Gypsy King, owned by George Riley, the Lady Haig, owned by Harry Meekins, the Rose Marie, owned by Fred Upton, the Golden Spray II, owned by Fred Roberts, the Moss Rose, owned by T.H. Adams, and the Botanic, which was owned by Herbert and Frank Budd. There was also a couple of lifeboats from the Dunbar Castle, a passenger ship which had struck a mine near the North Goodwin Sands in early January. Some of the survivors had made it ashore in these boats and they had been left where they landed on the beach just north of the pier. The boats that left our beach were taken to Dover Harbour and then towed across the channel by two Dutch scoots. Seven men from Deal sailed with them. Alfie Betts, Harry Brown and Fred Hook were on the Gypsy King. Fred Roberts, along with 70-year-old Jim O'Neill, manned the Golden Spray too, but unfortunately I cannot find the boat that Mr T O'Neill was on, but I can only assume he was on the Golden Spray too. Nat Cowan went over with one of the Dunbar Castle lifeboats, and all the rest were manned by Navy personnel. On hearing of their departure, the Vicar of St George's, with several members of the choir, made their way up onto the seafront, and along with some of the townsfolk, sung and waved as the boats and their crews left our beach. At Dunkirk, because the larger ships could not get close to the shore, it was the job of the smaller boats to ferry the waiting men out and onto them, so they could be brought back to England safely. There was no respite for the crews of these small boats, as there were so many men waiting to be rescued. The task must have sometimes seemed almost impossible, especially as the Luftwaffe were also constantly attacking them from above. There were many heroes at Dunkirk, but of the Dill Boatman I shall firstly talk about Harry Brown and his crew of the Gypsy King. Now even the small boats were unable to go right up and onto the beach, for they knew that once loaded with men, the extra weight would have caused them to become grounded and unable to move. So even the small boats would lay just off the shore in slightly deeper water so the men would have to wade out and onto them. And it was in these circumstances that the heroism of Harry Brown comes to light. There are several stories of him swimming with wounded men clinging desperately to his back and as he helped them out and onto the Gypsy King. There was also a moment when a group of soldiers were seen to be in trouble clinging to a pontoon which was in danger of being swamped by the wash of the larger ships as they manoeuvred to avoid air attacks. Harry dived into the water with a rope around his waist and made it fast to the pontoon. 
He then swam back to the Gypsy King, which was also full of men by this time, and they towed the pontoon with the men still on board out to the waiting ships. Fred Hook, who was also on the Gypsy King with Harry Brown, told the story of watching a German aircraft bomb a ship and many of the men being thrown into the water. The aircraft then returned and machine gunned them as they floundered helpless around in the sea. Harry Brown, like so many men after the war, was reluctant to talk of his experiences, but one of the incidences he did say that haunted him was when the Gypsy King was overloaded with men and in danger of capsizing, but still the men kept coming. He shouted he could take no more and asked for those clinging to the side to let go and wait, and he promised he would be back for them. Sadly, he remembers one poor soul who would not let go, and in the end, Harry had to force his hands off the gunnels. He remembers the man sliding back into the sea, and the next time he saw him, he was floating away, face down in the water. The Gypsy King and her crew were only there for a couple of days, but when Harry Brown did return home, apparently he was as black as the ace of spades, covered in muck and oil, and still wearing the clothes he had left him. He was recognised as a hero and awarded an honour by the French government, but because of reasons best known to himself, he never collected it. Harry eventually ended up as coxswain of the warmer lifeboat, going on to save so many more lives. A real hero. 70 year old Jim O'Neill was another hero. He was part of the crew on the Golden Spray 2 and would go ashore to help the wounded and non swimmers out and back onto his boat. The Golden Spray 2 had successfully taken five loads of troops off the beach and was returning for the next one when she was hit by the wash of several destroyers who were taking evasive action from an air attack. All the crew were knocked overboard and the boat was disabled. The Golden Spray 2 was then lost in the mayhem of the act of evacuation. The Moss Rose was lost when she broke adrift while being towed away from the beach. But the Gypsy King survived even though a fair few bullet holes were found in her once she was back in England. The Lady Haig was severely damaged and put out of action, but did manage to get back to Dill Beach. The Britannic was reported missing and was believed to have been sunk at Bray Dunes, and the Rosemary was also lost along with the two lifeboats from the Dunbar Castle. Talking of the Dunbar Castle lifeboats, I would now like to mention another Dill hero, Nathan Cohen of whom I would have known nothing about if it wasn't for the newspaper clipping that David Chamberlain had kept and kindly passed on to me, and I thank him for that. Nat Cohen was born in Deal in 1911. He was educated at Sir Roger Manwood School, where he showed signs of becoming an outstanding mathematician. He was also a great sportsman and a member of the Deal Rowing Club. After the death of his parents, it was left to him to bring up his younger brother and sister by running the family furniture business in the High Street. The outbreak of war saw a large influx of Jewish refugees into England and many ended up being housed in the old First World War camp at Stoner, where the Discovery Park is now. He went there as a volunteer to help them with learning our language and other needs. Then came the call for Dunkirk and he again immediately volunteered to help and saw himself being towed over to the beaches of Dunkirk in one of the Dunbar Castle lifeboats. On his arrival at Dunkirk, he was assigned four naval ratings to help him. Two of these men were from Newfoundland and only joined the Navy five weeks earlier, but he said of them, their courage more than made up for their lack of experience. He also commented that I swore them enough to make them good oarsmen and we all worked hard together until no one could stand up anymore. They would continuously row the boat ashore, fill her up with troops and back out to the larger ships and this was done non-stop until all the men were off the beach. He described the scene as destroyers continuously gave covering fire as over our heads planes were fighting everywhere and then at almost regular intervals some would come down and bomb us just for good measure. On his return to Deal, he was a little overwhelmed by all the well-wishing and back-slapping that he, and he commented to one of his friends, it's amazing the number of people who have suddenly taken interest in my well-being, folk 
who haven't noticed me for years and I find it quite nauseating. The blokes who stood on the beaches waiting without a sign of panic and the sailors who manned the destroyers working for days on end without a break were the real heroes of the show. I just went for a bit of fun and got it all for free too. A day trip to Belgium, no passport, no ticket. I kept thinking I'm going to wake up soon and I wasn't even seasick which was easily the most remarkable feature of the trip. After Dunkirk, Nat joined the RAF and because of his mathematical skills became a navigator with 464 Squadron, famous for its raid on Armen's prison. But it was on a mission to bomb the Philips radio factory at Eindhoven on December the 5th 1942 when he was reported missing and never returned. He's buried in Eindhoven General Cemetery. Nat Cohen wasn't a boatman but was a man of extreme courage combined with immense modesty and I would like to think that one day the rowing club would honour him in some way or another. The men of Deal and their boats have played their part in England's darkest hour. They left not knowing what they were letting themselves in for but they knew they were needed and went to do what they could. They must have quickly realised the gravity of the situation and what they were caught up in and also the enormity of the job and what had to be done and how desperate things were. They would have worked 24 hours a day between them, taking men from the shore to the waiting ships and all this was done under constant air attack. Brave men indeed. Another well-known deal boatman who was involved in the evacuation was Ben Bailey but he was a naval reservist stationed on one of the largest ships. We now come to the story of the warmer lifeboat, the Charles Dibbon. With a call for all boats to go to Dunkirk, the Ramsgate and Margate lifeboats both left immediately, both fully crewed to help in the evacuation. The secretary of the warmer lifeboat station considered the risk of damage to the lifeboat was too great to let her go, and also argued that because of the situation, she would be badly needed here in the Downs. He had also asked the Navy to guarantee help for the families of any of the men who were wounded or killed and the Navy said that they would help but refused to put it in writing. So because of these facts he refused to let her and the crew go. Warmer was not the only station that refused to let their lifeboats go so the Navy ordered the requisition of all lifeboats and sent reservists to take them over to Dunkirk. Charles Dibbon was badly damaged when she struck a submerged army truck and was taken away for repairs to Norfolk and whilst undergoing these repairs tracer bullets were found lodged in the bulkhead close to the fuel tanks. By the 4th of June the evacuation was over and like so many times before Deal had played its part in England's history. Much is made of the evacuation of Dunkirk and rightly so but also spare a thought for the RAF and Royal Navy. The RAF who were fighting out of sight of the beach trying to prevent the Luftwaffe from getting through and doing their best against overwhelming odds. Although there were those stories about their lack of presence they too like everyone else have made the ultimate sacrifice to save the men on the beaches. Luckily the Royal Navy still ruled the waves and the blockade they enforced to the north and south through the evacuation route allowed for the miracle of Dunkirk to take place. And also spare a thought for the weather, for the gods must have been on our side. Imagine it, if the weather had been bad it would have been a totally different story. Of all the dill boats that went to Dunkirk, the Lady Haig is the only survivor. She was built in 1928 for Harry Meekins the then landlord of the Port Armed, by the local boat builder Dan Trott at his North Deal boatyard. She was 27 foot long, clinker built of oak and elm, and like all Deal boats she was designed for beach work, being able to be launched and recovered from the sea in all weathers. Deal boats were famous for their toughness and were fantastic workhorses, renowned throughout the world. Even Nelson insisted on using deal boats and boatmen to come ashore whenever he was in the Downs. Her home was on the beach opposite the Port Arms and she was a true hoveller. She worked any time, anywhere and took on any job, 
from taking supplies out to ships anchored in the downs and to helping with the salvage of ships, those unfortunate enough to be trapped in the Goodwin's fatal embrace. She never once received any money for all the lives she saved, but instead relied on the payment of bounties for all the salvage cargo she retrieved. On quiet days she would be used for fishing and pleasure trips, and on bad days she might have been used for smuggling, I couldn't possibly say. But her real fame and pride comes from the many rescues she performed and the lives that she saved, too numerous to mention here. At Dunkirk she was manned by the Royal Navy, but was so badly damaged she was withdrawn from service and towed back to our beach. She was lucky to survive. Some time after Dunkirk she was sold and kept at Ramsgate Harbour, but she still remained active, being kept busy as so many ships came to grief in and around our waters due to the mines, submarines and air attack. After the war she went back to her quieter days of fishing and pleasure trips and was eventually sold and converted into a cabin cruiser. She was kept on the River Stour for a little while but she soon made her way back home and was kept on the beach again. Unfortunately in the severe storm of 1978 she was smashed against one of the winches situated on the beach. She was so badly damaged that she was left there to rot where she lay. It is now all credit to Mr John Burbridge, who on hearing she was about to be burnt went and rescued her. He made the necessary repairs and took her to Margate Harbour, bringing her back to full working order. She spent her last days bringing a lot of happiness to people, fishing and trawling around Sandwich Bay. Mr Burbridge ensured her future by selling her to Dover Museum and hopefully one day she will return to Dill, a permanent reminder of the real heroes that many of the Dill boatmen were and the famous Dill boats. There is one more interesting story about the Lady Haig as she ferried the troops from the beach to the waiting ships. When Harry Meekin owned her, the crew more often than not was Dick Brown and his son Jim Brown. Now Jim Brown's cousins at the time of Dunkirk were both Grenadier Guards and both of them ended up on the beach at Dunkirk. And when it came to their turn to be rescued, I will give you one guess as to which boat rescued them from the beach. Correct, the Lady Haig. And one last point, it was the Golden Spray 2 that left Dill Beach and went to Dunkirk and was sadly lost. But the Golden Spray 1, her sister ship, still exists and is almost identical to the one that was lost. She is now owned by Ivor Lewis and is kept in immaculate condition on the beach by the lifeboat station and is well worth a visit and long may she survive. Thank you.